Welcome to the church. I'm Brittany, where our vision is to build a church for God around the presence of God. Thank you for joining us for our Sunday experience. Our prayer is that this word aligns you with him, connects you in your daily experience as we advance his kingdom. As this word encourages you, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment on all platforms. How many of you like to win? Okay, how about this? How many of you like to lose? I thought so. So who likes to win? Come on, somebody. That's what I'm talking about. Keep leave that there. It's okay. Well, I want to welcome everyone here to the church. If it's your first time, yeah, we are crazy like this every Sunday. <laughs> So if you ain't here, you're missing out. You got to come every Sunday. So um, we're going to go ahead and start with some word. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to go ahead and open up to the book of Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, and we're going to be looking at verse 13. And then as custom in this house, we stand at the reading of God's word. So if you could please all... Stand with me now. If you did not have, if you don't have your Bible with you, don't worry. We have it up here on the screens for you. Um, and I believe this is the NIV version. Amen. Here we go. My name is Sonny Torres. I'm the lead servant here at the church, where our vision is to build a church for God around the presence of God. And if you want my notes, I share my notes. So all you got to do is text TC notes to 77411 and you can get all of my notes for today. Isaiah 42 and 13 says it like this. The Lord will march out like a champion. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. I must say this one again, because you know what? It deserves to be said with a lot of angst, a lot of angst, a lot of, come on somebody. The Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal with a shout. He will raise the battle cry and he will triumph over his enemies. Come on, let's give God praise in this place. Let's pray church. Let's pray. Father, it's your house and we're your people. And I don't care what we've planned, Lord God, whatever you want and whatever you desire, Lord, then you do it, Lord God. We're here to serve and worship and get to know and lift you up. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people say, amen. amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've never worn shorts and preached. So, amen. Amen. I want to keep this as short, right, as simple as possible. Short like a, like a Pentecostal preacher will. <clears throat> it's Easter Sunday. But to the believer, we know it more as Resurrection Sunday, right? Now, there may be some of you who are members of this church and you've been serving in this church. There may be some of you here who you've been coming to the church for some time, but you just haven't completed or taking that next step to be planted here at the church. Maybe uh, some of you are here today because someone invited you. 
Maybe you're here today because you got a postcard. Look like that. Or you saw a post on social media. Amen. Maybe you're here today because you couldn't think of any other church to attend on Easter Sunday. For some of you, maybe it's been a while since you've been to the church. And maybe for some, it's your first time here in a church. So whatever the case may be for you, I just want to tell you, I believe that this message is for you. For the believer and for the non-believer. For the never been saved, for the used to be saved. To the just got saved and to the saved since the birth canal, I believe with all my guts and liver that this message is for you today, church. In order to understand this scripture, we have to understand who this scripture is talking about. And most importantly, what makes him our champion. If you're a believer, then let this message just further encourage you to keep fighting the good fight of faith. Because you remind yourself here today what your champion did for you and what it is that he continues to do for you. And if you are a non-believer here today, then let this message introduce you to the one who wants to be your champion forever. I want to be the first to introduce you to Jesus Christ. Now, most churches on Easter Sunday, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, it's preached. And I've come to say that without any of these components... You do not have the message of Easter. Hear me, church. Jesus Christ, he came into this earth. He came to this earth through a virgin named Mary. He was born just like you and I. He walked this earth for what many scholars to believe was about 33 years. And then he was crucified on a cross. He was buried in a grave. And then on the third day, he rose from the dead. Church, he came to this earth for you and I. He died for you and I, and he rose for you and I. This is what makes him our champion. Believers, anything that he has done for you past that for your life, I'm here to tell you, it's just bonus. It's bonus living. And I was telling Pastor Brittany the other day, I don't deserve to be here. I, I, don't, I don't deserve to live the life that I'm living right now. I told Pastor Brittany, I shouldn't be here. I was straight serious with her. I said, I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to have the life I have. I don't deserve to have the family I have. I told her, I don't deserve to have you in my life because there was a time in my life where I know where I was headed. I knew I grew up in the church, but I reached a crossroads in my life where I knew if I go down this road, this path, I know, I knew what it would lead me to. But then there was a path that I had never been down before. And it was a path that I couldn't see and I couldn't understand. But God was calling me down that path. And I just come to here tell you, church, like Matthew Guzman says, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Because the life I live is bonus living. This is a bonus life I'm living right now. And, you know, and I just come to tell you, church, I just come to tell you that if, if, when, if you are a non-believer and you accept Jesus in your life, I'm here to tell you, anything that happens past that is bonus living. Church, we must hunger and we must thirst for our champion. Pull up that scripture. You can pull that scripture back up in Isaiah. If you have the ability, pull that up. It says that he stirs up his zeal. What does that mean? In other words... He stirs up, watch this, his pursuit or his devotion to the cause. What's the cause? <laughs> to save us from our sins, church. To be our champion for our sins. See, to hunger and thirst for your champion means that we remind ourselves that he is the only one that can save us from our sins. Now, how about, how about we go a little deeper? You guys want to go a little deeper? Are we tired of waiting in the, in the little shallow end, right? You remember, remember when you didn't know how to swim and you would just kind of put your feet in, right? Or, or maybe you're just like me. I didn't know how to swim. But you know what? I was, I was willing. So I grabbed the side and I just crawled my way all the way around. I felt important because I was in the deep end. I didn't know how to swim, 
but I pulled myself to the deep end. So I just want to encourage some of you. Maybe you not, don't know how to swim in the scripture, but just hold on to the wall and join us in the deep end, okay? Thank you, Holy Spirit. He's so good. He's so good. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to see that Jesus has always been our champion way before the cross. We're going to see that in scripture right now. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to uh, Exodus. Exodus chapter 4. And we're going to look at verse 1. Now for, for the men of the church here, what I'm about to do and say is going to make a whole lot more sense now of what I posted last night on the Marco channel when I posted a clip of a movie. It's going to make a lot more sense. You're probably going to want to go back and watch it. This is a little preview for the men of Marco. Amen. Where are the men at Marco at? Where are you at? Yeah. Amen. All right. There's a, there's, a, there's a dog in here. It's okay. Exodus 4, starting in verse 1, says like this. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Moses replied, a staff. So the Lord said, I want you to throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground. And guess what? It became a snake. And Moses ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. And I want you to jump now to chapter 7 of Exodus. Go to chapter 7. And we'll look at verse 8. Now watch this. Remember that example that God did for Moses right there. Now here we are in chapter 7, verse 8. And it says this. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and they did just as the Lord commanded. Watch this. Aaron threw down, some translations say he cast down his staff in front of Pharaoh and his officials and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, some translations say rod, and it became a snake. But watch this, but Aaron's rod, Aaron's rod swallowed up their staffs. Now, maybe you grew up seeing this scene in a movie. Maybe you saw in the version of the Ten Commandments. You ever seen the Ten Commandments? I didn't know that it came out in the 60s. I did not know. Now, I was having a conversation with Elder Charles about, I've never seen the Ten Commandments. And he was like, shut up. Yeah, he did. He told me to shut up. And I listened. I obeyed. But I told him, I said, well, it came out in the 60s. I wasn't born until like, Late 70s. And then by the time I was able to watch it, you know, I'd watch it on CBS and I'd watch, you remember? You remember. And it would come out bits and pieces, right? You had to watch it on one day and then finish it. I never got to do that, you know, because I couldn't stay up late because I was young. But recently, this past week, because we were fasting from entertainment, and I said, what can we watch? Let's watch the Ten Commandments. It's Christian. We can watch it. So maybe you've seen that scene where Moses and Aaron, they throw down the the rod and it turns into a snake and then it eats the other serpents. Or maybe your version, maybe your version is the animated version, the, what is it? The Prince of Egypt. Maybe you've seen that version, right? A little more animated. animated. I see that that God looks excited over there. The the glory of God just hits you over there. Amen. (laughs) But I want to know what, what, what does the rod symbolize? And what does that have to do with Easter? I'll tell you, it has everything to do with Easter church. See in Psalm 23 and four in the King James version, it says, it speaks of the rod like this. It says thy rod and thy staff, it shall comfort me. In number 17, verse three in the King James, it says for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. In number 17, five, it goes on to say, and it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose, it shall blossom. Psalm 110 and 2 in the King James says, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. 
Ezekiel 20 and 37 in King James says, I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Now, church, if you look closely several times in scripture, Jesus is being referred to as the rod. According to scripture, as a believer, according to the scriptures, he is the rod that comforts me. According to scripture, he is the rod that is head over me. According to these scriptures, he's the rod that has been chosen and has blossomed for me. According to the scriptures, he is the rod that is my strength. According to scriptures, he allows me to rule over my enemies. And according to scripture, the reason why I'm able to live free from sin, why I pass into the bond of his covenant church, Jesus is the rod of my salvation. He's the rod. Come on, someone say, he's my rod. When you look at the rod of Aaron, I want you to notice something. What was the rod made of? Wood. Some of you trying to be all, some of you trying to be all deep, acacia. No, just wood, okay? <laughs> just wood. Seed, le- Lebanon, cedars of Lebanon. No, just, just wood. Now the cross that Jesus was crucified on, maybe you passed this test. What was it made of? There you go. There you go. Yes, Jesus was crucified brutally on a cross. Now, we don't want to talk about that. You see, to be crucified according to Roman law at the time, it was a slave's death. It was a criminal's death. It was the lowest of the lows death. Jesus was treated as the lowest of the lows when he was crucified on a cross. You see, church, Easter is incomplete without the crucifixion. You cannot preach the resurrection of Jesus at the grave on the third day unless you preach the crucifixion on the cross on Friday. I know a lot of us, we want to bypass the crucifixion because it's, we, we, it's too much for us. And I can't see that. I will tell you, I remember when Passion of the Christ came out. That was the one movie I can tell you for sure. I did not order some popcorn. Because that movie was too brutal. That movie was too real. That movie made me shy back. It made me go back. It made me look down. I couldn't stand it because of what they did. You cannot bypass the crucifixion church. And fast forward to the resurrection. Because the crucifixion is just as important as the resurrection. So here you have the rod of Aaron. What's the rod of Aaron told to do? Cast down. It's being cast down. It's being thrown down. Now, if the rod is a representation of, the rod is the representation of Jesus church, then the casting down of Aaron's rod, it is a type and shadow of Christ crucified. When you have Aaron's rod cast down before Pharaoh, Pharaoh is a picture of the enemy. Who's the enemy? Satan. Now let's back up for a second. When Jesus came into this world, what did he do? He made the great descent. He was what? He was cast down into this world. Look at Philippians 2, 6 through 7, the NIV. It says this, Jesus who, being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But watch this, he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant being made in what? Human likeness. So it's very clear that Christ's descent, it started way before the cross, church. It started when he came to this earth. But here's the beautiful thing, it didn't stop there. Because he went as far as being cast down onto a cross. Philippians 2.8 goes on to say that he humbled himself. And he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Church, he didn't just lie down on a cross. Come on, Jesus. Jesus didn't just happily, you know, look forward to laying down on the cross. Look look at Luke 22, 42 through 44. It paints a picture of a cast down Jesus. Watch this. Father, 
if you are willing and take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And watch this. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. You see that? And being in anguish, the Bible says Jesus was in anguish. He prayed more earnestly. Some of us have prayed earnestly about something. You know what I'm talking about. You have been in a situation where you prayed a thing, but then you got up and you went back down and said, I'm going to pray some more. Here is our Jesus who is being getting ready to get cast down on a cross and he is praying more earnestly. And the Bible says, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Church, when he was cast down onto the cross, he became one with the cross. And you know what? He did this. He did this for you and me. When Aaron threw down his rod, the rod is Jesus laying down his life. When the rod lays down, it's speaking of Jesus' death and his burial, church. Now watch this. When Aaron's rod is cast down, suddenly what happens? As God predicted, it becomes a serpent. Now the transformation is speaking of Jesus's taking on our sins. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. In the New Living Translation, it says it like this. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Now you might know the scripture to say, he who knew no sin became sin for us, right? Now follow me. When Jesus took on our sin, church, he became sin. But I want you to follow me. He did not become a sinner. Hear me, church, if you have heard it preached that way, that is a wrong teaching. Jesus never sinned. Here's an example. When a lamb prior to Jesus in the Old Testament, if you read your Bible, you read the stories that when someone sinned and they wanted atonement for their sins, a lamb had to be brought before a high priest and that lamb had to have no blemishes. If it had a blemish, even the slightest, it could not be sacrificed to the Lord. And when it was sacrificed to the Lord, what did it do? It bore our sins. It continued, though, to maintain its purity on the altar while bearing our sins. And at any point in time, had that lamb or that sacrifice sinned, even on the altar, God could not accept atonement for the people. It had to maintain its purity up to death. Come on, church. It was pure for us and yet became sin for us at the same time until its death. So when Jesus took our sin, he became sin, but he did not become a sinner. He maintained his purity while bearing our sins on the altar, which was what? The cross. He was still the rod, church. Because remember, before the transformation of the serpent, it was a what? It was a rod. And when Aaron went to pick it back up, what did it do? It turned back into what? The rod. What did it do? It turned back into its origin. The origin is not a serpent. The origin is the rod. I've just come to say that the only the Lord can tell stories like this church. When it turned into the serpent, it is a type and shadow of Jesus taking on our sin and yet maintaining his identity, church. Jesus laid down his life, took on our sins, and the entire time he maintained his identity. The rod, which is Jesus, is cast down in front of Pharaoh which is Satan, it lies down on the ground. And just like Jesus laid down his life for us, it turns into a serpent, which is Jesus bearing our sins and dying for us. Now, church, here's where it gets really good. See, when the rod transforms into the serpent, what happens? Weaker serpents come to try and intimidate the serpent. (laughs) 
what does the serpent do? Which remember, is the rod. Because even though it's changed its outward appearance, it has not changed its identity. What does the serpent do? It swallows up the weaker serpents. It kills them. And then Aaron, as described in Exodus chapter 4, what does he do? He reaches down. He picks up the serpent by its tail. He lifts it up and it transforms back into the rod. When it speaks of being lifted up, church, that is a type and shadow of Christ's resurrection. When he is lifted up, we see him again as what he has always been, the rod of our salvation. He is our Messiah, our King of Kings, and our Lord of Lords. He bore our sin, but sin could not keep him a sinner. It could not keep him in sin. He is our savior, perfect in every way. He is exactly what he always proclaimed to be, savior of the world. The one who bore our sin was not intimidated by death. But instead, what did he do? He swallowed up the very thing that had been persecuting all of us since the garden. He swallowed up sin. He swallowed up the the bearer of sin, swallowed up sin, death, and the grave. The bearer of sin swallowed up the weaker serpents, church. Death, sin, the grave could not overcome Jesus at the cross. It could not overcome Jesus at the grave. Here's an example. You know, when, where's it at, Mr. Allen? You have it right there? Okay, thank you, sir. I'm going to give you an example. When, when, when Lazarus, when Lazarus went into the tomb, how many remember, a couple weeks ago we talked about Lazarus. How many remember, how many, how many have memorized your shortest scripture ever? Who's, who's got it? Stand up and say it. From where? Boom, there you go. Here you go, Pastor Nisi. Five dollars, there you go. She gets coffee. You're welcome. Now, we talked about Lazarus went into the tomb, right? And it looked like what? It looked like the tomb or the grave or death that what? It swallowed up his body. But that's why Jesus said in John 11 and 25 in the King James, he said, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. See, in other words, if you believe in me, And if you believe in my death, my burial, and my resurrection, then sin, death, and the grave does not get to swallow you up because I have swallowed them up. Jesus says, you live because I live. I like what Romans 8.37 has to say about us. Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Church, we are more than conquerors. Why? Because he is our champion. Let me cue you all in. This is a temporal body. And once we pass from this earth as a believer, we enter into eternity with our Savior, where we await our immortal and glorious body at the second coming of Jesus. As believers, sin, death, and the grave can never and will never hold us. We don't have to go through what Jesus went through. Listen closely, church. We go from this world to that glorious world in heaven with Jesus forever, and death for us is just the doorway to eternal life to get there with Jesus. We don't have to pass through what our champion had to pass through when he bore our sins. He died for our sins and was buried for our sins. But church, I just come to say, all we have to do is allow Jesus to lift us up. Just as he is lifted up, he lifts us up. Because he is lifted, we are lifted. Because he goes up, we go up. We don't have to go down. We can go up. He went down, he laid down, he was cast down, he was beaten down, he went down. Why? So that we could go up, so that we don't ever have to go down. I just come to encourage you, you don't have to go down. 
You don't have to beat yourself down. You don't have to count yourself out. You don't have to think you're a loser. You don't have to think you're unworthy. All you have to do is accept the gift. Just accept Just accept Jesus. He says, just believe in me. Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God had uh, uh, raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's all we have to do. We don't have to be cast down unto a cross. We don't have to be brutally beat like Jesus was. We don't have to go through what he go through, the pain, the persecution, the abandonment. All we have to do, church, is believe. That sounds too simple because it is because it's that simple. When we accept Jesus as our savior, this is what happens here on this earth. We surrender our lives to him. That's the laying down. We confess our sins. That's when the great exchange takes place. Our sins for his redemption. We believe in the name of Jesus for our lives. And that is when we are born again. And we begin to live this new life with Jesus. And that church is when he lifts us up. Isn't it interesting church? That the very first sign and wonder that Moses and Aaron carried out before Pharaoh to let his people go. There was Jesus. See, if the devil was smart, he, if the devil was smart, he'd have seen this one coming. That Jesus was coming to set the people free. That when they cast down that rod, Satan was so stupid, he didn't see what was actually happening. Moses and Aaron were sending Satan, uh, they were sending him a message. This isn't just let my people go from your captivity, Pharaoh, but this is Jesus saying, let my people go. And he swallowed up the thing that has intimidated you for far too long, church. You don't have to be intimidated anymore because Jesus swallowed that up for you. Come on, somebody. But before the rod, before the rod could be lifted up, it had to be thrown down. Go ahead, let me take it off. Before the rod could be lifted up, it had to be thrown down. I said before the rod could be lifted up, it had to be cast down. Some, you can take this, you can take all this. Someone, someone had to do it, church. Were you going to do it? Were you going to do it? You expecting the president to do it? You expecting government officials to do it for you? You expecting your parents to do it? Come on, somebody. You expect your grandparents to do it for you? Come on, you expect the pastor to do it for you? You expect your friends to do it for you. I'll just come to tell you, church, there was someone who said, I'll do it. There's someone that said, I'll do it. His name is Jesus. And before, before he could be lifted up, he had to be cast down. He had to enter into the fight for our lives. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We pray that you were blessed and stretched by today's word. Maybe you need a prayer or have a question for us here at the church. Make sure to fill out our contact form on our website at thechurchphx.com and stay connected with us on our Instagram and Facebook at The Church PHX. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday at our 10 a.m. Sunday experience, either in person or online. And remember, we are the church, building a church for God around the presence of God. Thank you.